Right, peace everyone. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Moroccan Post School for, gov for inter Government and International Law. Yes, today is February 8th, 2023. And uh, we have a really good presentation today. Um, we have our the YouTube page, the Moroccan Post Media YouTube page. All right, so you know, click, subscribe, and like. All right, so this uh, as this class will be as this class will be uploaded tomorrow on the Rocket Post Media YouTube page. All right, so we also have my uh, my books on the Moroc on the Moors Moorsandmasonry.org. Moorsandmasonry.org. Go to Moors and Masonry, Masonic Compass Square, and the connection and measurement of timekeeping. Uh, etymology and vocabulary, etymology and vocabulary, something that you want. We have the How Her Venus and Moon Rule and Coming Your Way Soon, Moors and Mastery Part Two, The Power of Moors Treaties, and Recovery of Lost Moors Sovereignty. Yes, so then we have that we have a very good class for you today. Oh, uh, yeah, in uh, Jonesboro, Georgia. Yours truly, along with Makakuvu, Ali Il Bay, and Seymour Bay, will be in uh, Jonesboro, Georgia, presenting. I uh, was the title: "The Untold, the Untold History and Story of Quote Unquote Black America." All right, so we want to do that to draw the uh, the unconscious people. I'm the keynote speaker. The guest speaker is Brother Makakubu Ali Il Bay. And that we'll have the brother on the um, on our Moroccan Post media on the uh, Moroccan Post on Trump TV. We'll probably we'll have him on in the next probably next couple of months. Yeah, I'll talk to him about that along with Shim Malakai Bay. Yeah, so um, today's today's lesson is a, addressing the misconception that Moors are part and parcel slash partial to the United States. Examining the definitive the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States. The don't forget, uh, Amanda. You want to read? I can't see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't forget about the sovereignty of the English British Crown. Note the English British Crown extended English British sovereignty to the thirteen original states through Article One of the seventeen eighty three Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States. Note: the thirteen original states extended the British sovereignty extended to them through Article One of the seventeen eighty three Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States to the people of the United States. Hence, the phrase "We the people of the United States." in the preamble to the United States Constitution. In the Articles of Confederation, United States of America is known as the style name, quote, the style of this Confederacy shall be the United States of America. The purpose of the questions, the following questions are presented to the public to clarify with solid documentary evidence and critical thinking, the misinformation and misconcepts that one, the Moors are part and parcel or partial of the United States. Two, the Moors are, quote, we the people in the preamble to the United States Constitution. Three, 35 Moors were part of drafting the United States Constitution at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Four, the Moors are the founders of the United States. Five, the United States Constitution is the Moorish Constitution. 
by showing evidence that the original foundational authority for the United States is derived from Article I of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States. Note, some conscious Moors have claimed for over 30 years that, quote, we the people in the preamble to the Constitution, United States Constitution denotes the Moors and Moorish sovereignty. The statement, quote, do ordain this Constitution for the United States of America. Some conscious Moors have claimed for over 30 years that this statement means the Moors are delegating authority to the Albions to function as a national government. Hence, Moors claiming the United States Constitution is the Moorish Constitution and the United States government is the Moorish government. Misconception. We, the people of the United States, the pre-existing Moorish empire, do ordain this constitution for the United States of America, the 13 original states. Misconception. We, the people of the United States, the repository of Moorish sovereignty and the source of government power, do ordain this constitution for the United States of America, the 13 original states. Misconception, Moors are part and parcel or partial of this said government and must live the life accordingly. Federal government, the Moors, we the people of the United States, do ordain this constitution for the United States of America, the state's government, the Albions, the misinformation, misconception, is that the Moors established the federal central government and the Albions established the 13 original state governments. Should this claim be true, it would mean that the delegates from the 13 original states did not convene at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, representing as delegates their respective states. Should this claim be true, it would mean that the delegates from the states did not revise the Articles of Confederation. If this claim be true, it would mean that the delegates from the 13 original states did not sign the Constitution. If this claim be true, it would mean that the 13 original states did not hold ratification conventions in 1788 to ratify the Constitution after the Constitutional Convention proper concept. Article 1 of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States allows each of the 13 original oh, states. You know Tell you what, that's, don't, don't, don't read the proper concept because okay. that's going to give the answers. We go, we go right to yes, that's going to give the answers. So um, this, the misconception. Now, the, the, the misconceptions I taught for 25 years to thousands of people. 25 years to thousands of people, literally. That was my, um, you know, I, I recall uh, taking out the Federal Reserve note hundreds of times and, you know, on the back of the one note, it has underneath the pyramid, it, re it reads the great seal and underneath the eagle, the prepositional preposition phrase of the United States. And I and I show that, use that to to um, as I thought was would be evidence, would be evidence, you know, to support the claim that Moors are the founders of the United States, that Moors are we the people, you know, all the uh, no, no documentary evidence, no documentary evidence that I've ever seen. And so the only evidence, the only point that I referenced that I used was that Federal Reserve note. But notice that I, this, this is a point of analysis when I have the, the subjunctive mood, should this claim be true? Should this, should these, this claim be true, then this can't be true. So where, so that's, um, I have 27 questions. 
And I want to give um, one first given great appreciation and honor to Shimala Kai Bay for uh, um, stimulating and challenging me to expand my mind and also expand my reading and my research and my references, you know, so as I can, so as to have a solid foundation to, to examine the misconceptions that I had been taught and, and also which I had taught for 25 years. So um, definitely want to give great honor to Shimala Kai Bay. Um, I give honor to him in my book, Moors and Mastery Part Two. And I did read that, uh, but he doesn't know what I wrote, but he, he's in there in the acknowledgement page. And he won't know that until the book comes. He won't know what I wrote until the book comes out. Uh, also, um, the 27 questions, Yannick, Brother Yannick, Dorsey Ill, uh, about three, two and a half weeks ago, I was in um, Starbucks. I work in Starbucks. To, I'm in Starbucks to work in my group. And uh, it was a Sunday. And uh, it was about, um, we had been on, you know, we talk, Yannick and I talk every day. And uh, we were, and, and I was about to um, take out my, my laptop to, to begin working on my book that day. And Yannick said, uh, before I could do that, would you uh, give me 10 questions that relating to the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and, and the United States? I said, well, I don't know if I have 10 questions in me. I got about maybe two or three. So by the time we get off, before we got to the phone, I ended up having 12 or 13 questions, generating 12 or 13 questions. And then uh, we end up hanging up at one o'clock. Starbucks closes at two o'clock on Sunday. I said, well, don't need for me to take out the laptop. You know, let me, let me generate some more questions. I ended up generating additional eight questions. And then I got in and laid across the bed. I said, well, you know, took out my notebook and I generated maybe four or five additional questions. So here you have these, uh, these 26 or 27 questions. All right, so Amanda, Amanda did read two weeks ago. Amanda read all 27 questions. And um, first, and then I answered, um, she reread questions one, two, and three, and we ran out of time. But now we'll have time to go through all 27. So Amanda, you're gonna read the first question? Yeah, should I only do the first? Do the first, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number one, did the Revolutionary War between Great Britain and the United States extinguish pre-Revolutionary War contracts that were granted to British subjects by the British, British Crown during the 1600s and 1700s in British colonies? All right. There is, in the, the, the what fact, one of the that fact, the first treaty case that Shim presented to us um, is Society versus New Haven. Society versus New Haven, Society of the Gospel of the Propagated Faith versus New Haven, um, 1823 case. And uh, the Mr. Webster was the defense attorney for New Haven. And uh, he made the claim as what's taught in the schools that even to this very day and was out taught to the general public to this very day that the Revolutionary War that society does not have claim to the property. And uh, New Haven had portion that actually had taken the property and sold it. And that the society's claim was based on a charter granted by the English crown. And uh, Mr. Webster, the defense attorney claim was that because of the Revolutionary War, the Revolutionary War extinguished societies, the New Haven society claim to property. That was the, the defense attorney's position. The Supreme Court ruled that the Revolutionary War did not extinguish pre-Revolutionary War contracts. 
because the that was a personal right. So the 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 grant to society was a personal right, and the treaty between the definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States of 1783, 1783 did not extinguish personal rights. So look, this is a this is a principle of, in international law when you have dealing with session treaties or conquests and and you have the transfer of land through session treaties or relinquishing relinquishment through treaties personal rights are not relinquished the inhabitants personal rights to property is not relinquished so that's a in fact people versus state people versus state 1973 referenced that international law principle all right, so that's number one. Number two. Number two, does the United States derive its original foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 English British colonies charters from article one of the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States or does the United States original foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 English British colonies charters derive from the United States Constitution drafted in 1787? I, 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 Terrence, I need um, Article One of the Peace Treaty, and I also need that I need the People versus Godfrey. All right, so they're not going to say Abdullah said anything. Article One, to answer this question. I got to, we got to go to Article One of the Definitive Peace Treaty and People versus Godfrey. All right, I'll have to bring those up. All right, so bring those up. I don't, All right. I don't, I don't have them right now, but I'll bring them All up. All right, number three, number three, we'll go to three. So it's good, get, you can get those and we'll, I'll do number three. Because I'm, I'm going to need those because I don't want them to say Abdullah said anything. So number three. Number three, do the original 13 states derive their authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 English British charters from their state's constitutions of 1776, Declaration of Independence of 1776, the Articles of Confederation, the more recent states' constitutions, or the United States Constitution drafted in 1787? All right, so two and three, I need both. I need, in order for me to show them the answer two and three as and present evidence, I need the People versus Godfrey and, and the Article One. Because I what I did was I um with question three is question two and three are some are somewhat are somewhat related. Are somewhat related. All right. So let's go to four. Let me know when you have them up, Terrence. Have them ready. Uh, it's it's a little difficult to uh, to not have it ready, so um, because if I switch the screens, it's gonna. All gonna... right, so no problem. All right, then I'll just let's go back to two, Amanda. I, I need, all right, let's go to two. All right, Article One of the seventeen eighty three Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and United States. Let me first give the answer. The answer is neither. We read, read number two, Amanda. Number two, does the United States derive its original foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 English British colonies charters from Article I of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States or does the United States original foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 English British colonies charters derived from the United States Constitution drafted in 1787? Can somebody pull up Article 1, the Ch Definitive Peace Treaty and the People versus Godfrey? Yannick, someone, Sheehan, someone, get this, all right? So now uh, in, uh, in Article 1 of the Definitive Peace Treaty, United States, and in the 
in the Articles of Confederation that the language United States viz, and each one, each state is named. Viz is the Latin for namely. So that's, that's so under the Articles of Confederation, the 13 original states formed as a league of independent free sovereign states under the Articles of Confederation. That United States and each of them are named doesn't just it doesn't just read United States, United States vids. And that means name each one a name in the, individually. That structure is in Article One of the Definitive, Definitive Peace Treaty. I put the link in the chat. So the yes, and I want someone to read up from there. So the so the question reads. Does the United States, United States didn't claim any authority dealing with the land. It was the 13, 13 states. So in article one, can we, do we have it up? Somebody, somebody just read it. Just read article one. Somebody, somebody, article one, please. Yes, Article 1, His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States, viz, namely, New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia to be free, sovereign, and independent states that he treats with them as such and for himself, his heirs and successors relinquishes all claims to the government propriety and territorial rights of the same and every part thereof. Now you have viz and each state a name. Then you have them, he treats with them. It doesn't really treats with it, I mean, he treats with them, that's a, that's a personal pronoun, objective case, plural, and independent states, states is plural. And people versus Godfrey. So we have it up there. All right. here, here, here it is. So, um, you know, scroll. Article one. So then we're going to see article one. Here it is. You read it again, Amanda. People can. His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States, viz, which means namely, New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, North Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, to be free, sovereign, and independent states that he treats with them as such and for himself his heirs and successors relinquishes all claims to the government propriety and territorial rights of the same and every part thereof. All right. People versus Godfrey, 1819, which is a New York, New York State Supreme Court case, not a United States Supreme Court case. This is a New York State Supreme Court case, 204 years old. 204 year old case, 1819. The case surrounded, the issue of the case was a, a soldier in the army had a, another soldier, you know, who was um, held, who was a prisoner and he was being taken to the barrack. And um, the soldier killed the the prisoner soldier who had was a prisoner uh, with a bayonet. Now, now this the issue was for dealing with the trial of the case with the soldier who was had been uh, who had been accused of killing this um, the other the soldier with the bayonet was does the federal government has jurisdiction or does the New York State government have jurisdiction? The federal United States, the federal government claimed 
to have jurisdiction because it's a military barrack. Now, in the case, it looked at the chain of custody where the European occupational claim, France, France ceded in, in 1763 to Great Britain. And that's peace treaty between Great Britain and France. And then, so, and so, great, so now Great Britain relinquished that to New York, not to the United States. Great Britain did not relinquish to United States. Great Britain relinquished to New York, Article One of the Peace Treaty, Article One. So in so the ruling is that New York has jurisdiction because where the barrack is, yes, it's a military barrack, but where the barrack is, and you, New York State Supreme Court use reference the 1783 Treaty of Paris between Great Britain and United States and the 1795 Jay Treaty. That, that has never gone to the Supreme Court. Remember the Supreme Court, if it were to go to Supreme Court, what are they gonna, they can't overturn that. Remember they have to write their opinions. When they can't go to a United States, they can't go to United States Constitution. They can't go to United States statute to overturn that. So my claim is that the definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States of 1783 is the ruling authority for the United States. What was the ruling authority? Not the United States Constitution, and that's and that people versus Godfrey. Not the United States Constitution, not United States statute at large, not even the New York statute. It was the definitive peace treaty. And this is 204 year old case. 204 year old case. And as I'll continue, number, number three, number three. Abdullah, what, what, um, uh, for the people versus Godfrey, what uh, section would you like to look at? Uh, where it reads that United States did not, the, um, did not, did not receive any grant. Okay. Um, what yeah. I read on Crumb T when we were on that two, two and a half weeks ago. I, I can't see it, so yeah. yeah. We consider it beyond all doubt that- There you go, that's it, that's it. Go ahead, Amanda, that's it. We consider it beyond all doubt that the United States acquired no territorial rights to any portion of this state in virtue of the treaties of 1783 and 1794. Neither of those treaties contain any words of grant to the United States as such nor should we have submitted to accept as a grant what had already been acquired by our arms and established by the solemn declaration of independence. The Congress under the Articles of Confederation were the representatives of the several states and having the power to make war and peace were a party to the treaty of peace, were a party to the treaty of peace in behalf of the Confederated States and every stipulation in the treaty inured to the benefit of the states in their sovereign capacities. When, therefore, it was agreed by the Treaty of Peace of 1783 that Great Britain should withdraw all, with all convenient speed its garrisons from the United States and from every port, place, and harbor within the same, that agreement was for the benefit of the several states within whose limits those garrisons were. The section of the Articles of Confederation removes every doubt upon this subject. It provides that, quote, each state should retain its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which was not thereby expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled, end quote. And this is not within our knowledge or belief that the United States have ever claimed or set up any pretension of property to any fort within the boundaries of a state under these treaties. 
Article one of the Definitive Peace Treaty, United States Biz. Now, I remember Quasi, you remember our conversation that um, I was discussing this with Quasi. Uh, it's Quasi on now. And um, I had him read Article one. And um, he said he wasn't getting it. And I said, well, read it without, read it without the viz in the 13 states. Read it without it. Read it without it. So I want you to do, Amanda, read it without it. You're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to read the viz in the 13 states. Go ahead. Okay, Article 1. His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States and that he treats with them as such and for himself, his heirs and successors relinquishes all claims to the government propriety and territorial rights of the same and every part thereof. All right, so we have them and we have independent states. When you remove the viz in the 13 states, this doesn't make sense. We move the viz in the 13 states, but you have the you have the person you have the personal pronoun objective case them, and you have states is plural. So this is what I had quasi do, so that we can you know, so once it's grammar, it's grammar, it's grammar. So we move the viz. So someone says, well, Abdullah, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, let's remove it. And why and what does it what why is why is viz used? That construction is used in the Article of Confederation because they they formed as a league of independent. They retained that independency and sovereignty. They, they, they retained that on the Article of Confederation. And when they negotiated that treaty, they retained it in the Articles of in the, first, in the first Article One. And this is why New York has the jurisdiction and not the federal government. All right, number three. This is important. We're leading up now. This is this is this is when we we're building up to it now. We're building up to, so you can see, you know. Number three. three. Do the original thirteen states derive their authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the thirteen English British charters from their states' constitutions of seventeen seventy six, the Declaration of Independence of seventeen seventy six the Articles of Confederation, the more recent states' constitutions, or the United States Constitution drafted in 1787? None of the above. The answer is they derived their authority from the, article, from the 1783 Treaty of Paris as reference, as used in People versus Godfrey. And, and also, Martin versus Waddle, New Jersey, makes the claim of claiming certain rights under that 17, claiming certain rights under New York, New Jersey Colony Charter. That, New, in the case, Martin versus Waddle, New Jersey claims certain rights under New Jersey Colony Charter. So that's where they derived their authority to operate because they, they, the boundaries are laid out, so surveyed, and that surveyed boundaries is laid out in, the, in each, of the third, third, each of the proprietary colony charters, the company colony charters, and the royal colony charters. All right, number four. Any number questions before, any questions before I go on? Any questions? Comments? Criticism? Got hand clap? Any questions, comments, or criticism? 
Looks like DuPont has his hand raised as well. As, as well. All right, but. did DuPont? It's on. So uh, to better understand this, it's basically everything is filled within the British crown uh, uh, rulership. No, no, you, you got to qualify that. Hold on, hold on. You said everything. No, it, all, the, said all everything. the the original it's 13 done. colonies, the original 13 states are still up under the British crown rule. So how do United States fit into this? All right. Let's go. I mean, and, and, and I, want, I want to apologize because I was working at the time that I'm trying to listen to. All right. How did the United States once? All right. Once again, let me let me let me go back. So in order to answer, how does the United States fit into this? In 1776 and 1777, the freemen and esquires in in each in the 13 or more soil operating in the 13 colonies organized in a organized in constitutional conventions they drafted constitutions and ratified these are freemen and esquires living in the very 13 colonies organized in constitutional conventions drafted and ratify constitutional conventions, forming a separate, forming separate political body politics from the colonies. The colonies did not become the states. The colonies, I'm talking the colonies, you're talking the contract, you're looking at the proprietary colonies which is granted to proprietors. You have company colonies, Virginia. You have royal colonies. Royal colonies, uh, a, the, 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 the English crown points a governor to oversee the colony. You have a proprietary as well as companies, those are personal rights. So these are these so so 13, 13 body politics were, were established through 13 constitutional conventions and 13 ratifications, constitutional ratifications, forming separate. Then you have you have the Declaration of Independence. Then you have the Articles of Confederation, which was drafted in 1777. It was signed and ratified in 1781. So how does the United States fit in is that the 13 states form the United States. So I got to That's why I have to go back so you can see how it fits in. The 13 United States formed the United States. They formed as a league of 13 independent free sovereign states under the Articles of Confederation. They, you, in the Articles of Confederation, the language, United States viz, each one is named. What does that mean? In there, it reads, retains its independent free sovereign status. And each of them are named because if they didn't name them, that has a different meaning. If they didn't use viz and name each of them separate individually, then they would not have been a retaining of their independency. So the United, so the So the United States, we have the NFL and the Philadelphia Eagles, the NFL and the Kansas City Chiefs. The, the, NF, the, the Kansas City Chief is not the NFL. The Philadelphia Eagles is not the NFL. 
New England Patriots is not the NFL. The NFL, what, is the what? That's the parent. The that's NFL. The governing, the, that's the governing body. The go, so, the, so the governing body, the parent body. So the Philadelphia Eagles is part of the NFL. The Philadelphia Eagles is an independent, a independent company that's part of a league, NFL, National Football League. A NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles, is part of a league of 13 independent teams, independent companies. All right, here we go. United States, let me draw this analogy. United States and NFL. United States and NFL, Philadelphia Eagles, and uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia Eagles, and the uh, uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Philadelphia Eagles, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. NFL, United States. Help me out. Come on, if y'all don't understand, he's asking Great, really me, he asked me, how does the United States fit in? I'm answering. I'm gotta just kind of trying to break it down. So how does the United States fit in? Right. So when the definitive peace treaty was signed, they signed as a league of independent free sovereign states. So New Jersey state was granted the right through that article one of the treaty to operate in the boundary laid out in New Jersey County Charter, not the United States. United States was not granted that. United States was not granted. The NFL was not granted. The Philadelphia Eagles was. And that's what that means. That's what Article One means. And that's the position that New York State stood on in People versus Godfrey in 1819. King, uh, let me before I before I address you, King uh, Dupont, do you do you comprehend? Does everyone comprehend? Dupont, do you comprehend? Since you yes, the, sir. The yes, sir. All yeah. right. That's that's a that's a great breakdown, my man, my man, King. Yeah, brother. My head. This is what I need you to identify for the people when you talk about personal rights. Okay, because they need to understand the elements of personal rights and how the constructive language qualify and strictly you screw strictly construe the application of law in which determine the rights so that they can properly, when they read these instruments, they can properly identify the elements necessary when they raise these claims and arguments. All right, let me let me address that King. All right. When we when I when I raise the issue of personal rights dealing with session treaties and relinquishing, I'm talking international law. And, and, and you in state versus people, state versus Philip. And state versus Philip, Amanda, you want to read that? What I texted you earlier? It's that yeah, section, state versus Philip. And the state versus Philip, it has that section where it has the 13 states. All right. And state versus Philip, that, that will. Um, or no state what if I text you uh, I text that to you Terrence I text that to you Yannick uh, that this I, I text to all three of y'all that this supports people versus um, society versus New Haven that section in people in state versus Philip and I texted to you all right and made a made a connection to society versus New Haven 
That read, read that. Okay. It was the three screenshots. Yeah, the three screenshots okay. and also the text. Okay. So the text message that I gave Yannick, you and uh, Terrence. Okay, the text, this is the basis of the decision in the society versus New Haven case. A session of territory is never understood to be a session of property belonging to its inhabitants. Um, okay, in deciding, quote, and in deciding a question like this, we must not look merely to the strict technical meaning of the words of the letters patent, the laws and institutions of England, the history of the times, the object of the charter, the contemporaneous construction given to it and the usages under it for the century and more which, ha which has since elapsed are all entitled to consideration and weight. It is not a deed conveying private property to be interpreted by the rules applicable to cases of that description. It was an instrument upon which <laughs> was to be founded the institutions of a great political community and in that light it should be regarded and construed looking at the grant from such an overview two factors are significant its size and its purpose first hold on, hold on, hold on man let's go back up there i think you, you you skipped some go back to that session you didn't you go back the paragraph up paragraph back um which which paragraph because yeah, I want the to one that I said wrong. Well, I text well, I said okay it was this I got I got this one um was it was it the link the last the link but I just don't have that one pulled up on my computer so I can't send it yet uh Yannick put it in the chat this is so. the case this is the case state versus uh Phillips and it's before that paragraph you say you read it session treaty yeah uh Yannick put it in the chat here so I'll read from there a right. session of territory is never understood to be a session of the property belonging to its inhabitants. The king cedes that only which belonged to him. Lands he had previously granted were not his to cede. Neither party could so understand the session. Neither party could consider itself as attempting a wrong to individuals condemned by the practice of the whole civilized world the cession of a territory by its name from one sovereign to another, conveying the compound idea of surrendering at the same time the lands. Hold on, I don't have that, but I think this one. Yeah, that's, 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 good. that's good enough. That's good enough because I want to see, I want to have a basis to answer his question. This is that's a principle of international law. That's why we have to study international law. When you're dealing with session treaties, relinquishment, personal rights are not relinquished or ceded. Personal rights are not relinquished or ceded. So the basis of society versus New Haven is based off what Amanda just read. So people, so state versus state versus um, people versus, I mean, um, um, Philip versus state, that section should be read along with society versus New Haven. What Amanda read about secession, that should be read along with society versus New Haven. You need to use that with society versus New Haven because that goes into, society versus New Haven didn't go into the international law area as, the, as State and Philip did. They just read the Revolutionary War did not extinguish pre-revolutionary war rights. Whereas state versus Philip directed into session treaty. You know, it gave a more it gave a reason, a basis for the decision. So that's the that is the basis for this, that is the basis for the decision of society versus New Haven. It gives you a it gives you a better understanding. State versus Philip, that section in state versus Philip gives one a better understanding of and the basis of the decision made rendered in or society versus New Haven. 
All right. Go ahead, go ahead, King. You still have your hand up? Or you? Yeah, I got a question. Is that? You have another, you have another question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question. Is when you say personal rights, is that similar to the constructive language in the Constitution? Is that similar? Not saying that it's a part of international law. When they talk about fundamental rights as it relates to personal rights, or they're similar in context because right. the Constitution says you have fundamental rights, or are those the same as personal rights? All right. All right. Let's, 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 let me, let me, all right. Here we go. We, the people of China, hear me out. I'm just going to make a point. Just let, me, let, me, let, me, let me make my point. In the preamble of a constitution, right? Let's, let's not go to in the constitution right now. Let's go to the preamble. This is how you got it. We got to be jurists, man. We got to rise to be jurists. Let's go to the preamble of any constitution. Any constitution. The preamble of any constitution does what? Who the repository when it, we the people, that phrase, we the people, that or the people, you have the people used in a general sense as the people in the park. The people of the park are playing. I'm using people in the general sense. But when I use people in the political sense, I'm answering your question. When I use people in the political sense, what that means is the repository of the collective sovereignty of the people. The people are identified in the preamble. We the people of China. We the people of Mexico. We the people of Spain. We the people of Germany. We the people of England. We the people of Nigeria. All right. Now this one has we the people of the United States. Let's go back. No problem. Let's go back. We the people of the United States. So you, because you, King, you went right into the Constitution. I don't want to talk that right now. I'm gonna talk the preamble. Does that is that our constitution? I'm saying, so you went right, you jumped right into it. I'm going to first go into the preamble. Now let's go back. I said, in answering Stern's question, in 1776, in 1776 and 1777, there were 13 constitutional conventions. Free men and esquires convened in the 13 colonies in, a, in constitutional conventions. They drafted constitutions and they held constitutional ratification conventions, thereby forming separate political bodies from the colonies. In 1777, those 13 states, they were drafted the Articles of Confederation. It was ratified, when it was drafted during wartime, it was ratified in 1781. Once that was ratified in 1781, that formed them as a league that's a, that, a, as a, a league of independent, 13 independent sovereign states operating under the Articles of Confederation. Now, they convened because of not being able, the Articles of Confederation is, is, was not structured whereby they could be able to pay off the war debts because the the because the, the states 
United States and Congress symbol had to go to the, each of the states and the states didn't want to give up the finance to pay off the war debts and you got to be able to pay the debts. Then you have the, the states are, you know, still violating the Treaty of Paris. So this, they needed a stronger instrument. So John Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and uh, John Jay wrote the Confederate that wrote the Federal Papers. There were ninety-five. Like each one wrote different. You know, they 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 are the authors of the Federal Papers. And the Federal Papers, the purpose of the Federal of the Federal Papers, Federal Papers, was to was to encourage and educate the people about federalism. They wanted to push federalism. They wanted to push a more perfect union. A, they needed a stronger, a stronger instrument whereby they could be able to pay off their war debts and also be in compliance with international law and treaties. But Tao, uh, and the, the law nations, Locke, Vital, Kant were heavily used. Vital was heavily referenced because the, 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 the that, that when they, when they used the Madison plan, they didn't, they didn't go to the United States, that Constitutional Convention in 1787 with a blank paper. So the point I'm making is that the we the people of the United States. Where does the Moors fit into that? Let's not go into the Constitution. Not, don't read nothing. Do not read. Please, King, don't quote. Please, don't quote anything. No quote any article in the Constitution. Just stay with the, the preamble. Don't quote any article in the Constitution because that's a wrong move. Are you party to that? Let's go to preamble. Don't quote article one, two, three, four. Don't quote any article. Are you party to that? Let's go to the preamble. Let's go to the Articles Confederation. Let's go to the, 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 the Declaration of Independence. Let's go to this article one. Let's go to article one or the Definitive Peace Treaty. Are you party to that? Because you're making claims under claims of protection under that constitution as if you are what? A citizen. Brother, 25 years of misconception, brother. 25 years of misconception. That's why I was, brother. 25 years. I was in that position for 25 years. 25 years. I just wanted clarification. It wasn't. I, I'm, giving clear, I'm, I'm giving. I'm it giving. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for me because I understand. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you, King. Thank you. Please, y'all. That I love. I, let me let me clap for the brother. Let me clap for the brother because that is needed. That's why I'm doing this. I, we, I also. I also want to say they had what they call the the international parole rule of evidence. You cannot go outside the boundaries of the contract. If you try to use an other instrument or anything outside of the construction of that instrument that you're trying to apply, apply that's a violation. It's called the it's called the parole evidence rule. Well, let me let me let me all right, let me say this, King. I'm I'm going to um I'm going to I I hear that, but that doesn't mean I can't analyze it though. I hear that. I mean you can read something to me, but that doesn't mean I can't analyze it and use well settled principles in which to analyze what you present. All right. King, in treaty cases, in treaty cases, King. Let me, that's, that's used people versus Godfrey. People versus Godfrey. They went to the history. And treaty cases, they always go through history. 
Society versus New Haven, Ware versus Hilton. They will go to history. And in People versus Godfrey, they went to the history of how, you know, the the chain of custody of the of the um of the military barrack. And they referenced the, the 1783, the war between Great Britain and, and France, and the 1783, 1763 treaty between Great Britain and France. So they just looking at the chain of custody. So treat and treaty cases, they go to that. They go to the history of uh, 1952 case, 1952 case between France and the United States. You know, where three types of treaties were used to adjudic to determine the extent of the uh, United States constitutional jurisdiction in Morocco. So when you're looking at these treaty cases, so I, I hear what you're saying, King, I do, but I want to use treaty cases to, to analyze what you're saying. And they're, they're going, they go to the history. And so what I did was, and I, I learned this methodology through my study of etymology and also through my study of treaty cases and really analyzing the methodology used in writing treaty cases, the decisions and how they're lengthy and they go through the history and also referencing other cases so I, um, I just want to offer that to the students. Just want to offer that to the students. All right, thank you, King. I, this is good. I, the, the, the dialogue is wonderful, y'all. Keep bringing it at me. Challenge me, y'all. Please challenge me. Please challenge me, because that, that elevates all of us. All right, number, what question are we on? Amanda, what question are we on? I think, I think number five. Well, number five, go ahead. Did, actually, I think number four. Do the original 13 states derive their foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 British English charters from Article One of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States? Read, read that again, please. Do the original 13 states derive their foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 British English charters from Article One of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States? Yes. And we went, we went through that already. We read, we read Article One. We explained why. We explained, look, we looked, we read the language. We read the language in Article One because it's the language explains why. There's no not Abdullah anything. The language the, we explain vids what vids means. The thirteen uses states. We actually you you took you read it without the vids in the thirteen states. All right, and we also you also read the section in People versus Godfrey. All right, yes, number five. Number five. Did the English British Crown relinquish its territory jurisdictional boundaries outlined in the 13 English British charters to each of the 13 original states through article one of the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States or to the United States. To the, to the 13 um, states. Not to the United States. We look. Let's, let's go to Article One again. Article One of the Definitive Peace Treaty, United States vis, and you have People versus Godfrey. So it wasn't relinquished to the United States. It was to the thirteen individual states, because New Jersey state is claiming rights on the New Jersey Colony Charter. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania claiming rights under the Penn, Penn Charter. North Georgia State is claiming rights 
under the Georgia Colony Charter, which is a proprietary charter. South Carolina states claiming rights under the South Carolina Charter by virtue of Article One of that definitive peace treaty. All right, number six. Number six, does the Declaration of Independence of 1776 mark the independence for the United States? All right, this is a, this is a doozy one. And I wanted to, now we know that there is an instrument called the Declaration of Independence. And the United States did enter into treaty with France in 1770, 1777, 1778. And in that treaty, by the way, which I have this in Moore's and Bay Street, chapter part two, chapter five, chapter five, I um, have excerpts of that 1778 treaty between France and the United States, where the King of France, you know, makes the agreement to protect the United States against attacks, against Moorish attacks. That's in that treaty. That's 1770, 1778 treaty. So a lot of that, then you also have the, um, here's a pure majesty in from Morocco by virtue of the 17, 17, 1767 treaty between France and, 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 and Morocco of giving concessions to French merchants. And this is by this is why Muhammad Ibn Abdullah appointed a French merchant, Stephen de Altabart, as consul for unrepresented nations in United in Morocco, because that was a concession. French merchants gained concessions through the treaty between France and Morocco, 1760, 1767. Um, they didn't have that in the 17, 1631 treaty between France and Morocco, all right? Um, so the, the Declaration of Independence, does that give them independence? Well, they didn't have the 13 states did not have the right to operate on more soil in the British in the in the in the territorial boundaries laid out in each of the 13 county charters. They didn't have that right. Great Britain didn't acknowledge. Great Britain did not acknowledge the independence. Great Britain didn't relinquish until that peace treaty. So Yes, they negotiated, they had a treaty with France. They had this, this, initial, this official recognition from the Emperor Morocco, but they didn't have rights from the crown to operate in the boundaries of the colony charters until that, that, uh, 1783 definitive peace treaty. So what does that independence mean in the context of international law? If they, all right, if they didn't have, if Great Britain did, did all right, if Great Britain does not acknowledge them, let's, let's look at that, like, Great Britain doesn't acknowledge them. Where are they? If Great Britain doesn't acknowledge it, I mean, they didn't have rights to, to operate in the boundaries of the charters. Remember, they're, this is, they're not occupying sovereigns. These are, these are subjects that were at 1776. These are subjects. These are British subjects that are, that are in rebellion to their mother. They're not an occupying sovereign. They're not kings and queens and dukes and earls and counts and 
their subjects. So let's look at the genealogy. That genealogy doesn't change through the course of time. They're still subjects. Because after it's all said and done, there's, all right, after it's all said and done, I mean, after it's all said and done, as we recover, lost more sovereignty. That's, that's, we, as, we, as we work to gain, recover, lost more sovereignty. And repeal these land session treaties. After it's all said and done, they what? You you just peel off their subjects. They what? They're now going to be risers, kings, and dukes, and nobles, and counts, and marks, keys, and no, absolutely not. Because you're looking at genealogy, you're looking at lineage. That hasn't changed. They're just playing us. Great so, job, Adela. So what? So, so they're independent. So, all right, after it's all said and done, I mean, after we covered lost more sovereignty. They still maintain that level. So now, all right, that peace treaty, let's, 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 let's follow this, let's follow that. The, the peace treaty is repealed. Then what? Then what? what? Let's look at the genealogy. Let's do it. Let's look at the let's, let's look at the pedigree, which means ped, we means foot, and gree means tree. Your family tree. That doesn't change. This is why they do these the coat of arms, the family crest is that this is not part of our education. They locked us out of this level of, of you know, knowledge of heraldry and genealogy and lineage charts and you know, pedigree. They locked us out of that knowledge. Yes, uh, Sheehan. Peace, everybody. Now you still notice before on Christian, then you notice how I brought that in, how I brought heraldry in, genealogy in. Yes. You see how yes. you have like you have to have a this broad knowledge base. Right. And you and you have the you have the ability and the ability to build up to it and then and then make make the connection. And yeah. I think sometimes it's sometimes when you're still uh, when, when you're still clearing your concepts up, it can be. Uh, That's why you're here, brother. Why you're or, here. You, or, or, when, or when you're trying to help other people, they want you to get right to it, and you I can't mean, explain. You can't explain you four, five hundred years. Then you, you end can't. the conversation. You have to end the conversation. Then you have to end it. The con right, once they say get right to it, the conversation is over. If right, you talk to me, if you say get right to it, then I, the conversation is over. It's over. Because you it's over. Because for you can't get right to it. Not four or five hundred years worth of history in two or three right minutes. It. It's just like, yeah, it's just just it's in fact. Go ahead. Uh, what's your question? What's your question? Right. right. And, and it was more of a statement. So yes. If I so if I'm correct, let me know if I'm in error. I'm sure you will. If it doesn't matter, even if we gave them the authority to operate on our soil, they're still subject to, uh, they're still a foreign power, they're still foreigners subject to someone else's jurisdiction. So they would be subject still as subjects to the British dominion. No matter what we said, then they still wouldn't be able to operate he, he, without he that foundation. The head, He's jumping ahead, y'all. He's jumping ahead, but okay. <laughs> that, right. would be, is, so that's, so that would be that would be accurate for me to say it, it wouldn't matter what if we gave them authority to operate, 
then there's still other there's still foreign subjects to a foreign power so we can't give them the ability to operate in somebody else's political jurisdiction is it, am i am i i'm raising the roof brother i'm raising okay, the roof I wanna, I, peace yeah i just wanted to make sure do y'all do y'all understand now now do you understand what Sheen's saying? Give me the, let's give a principle. Let's look at the principle. Give me the principle by which he's making the statement. Because he was, I, I gave the explanation of genealogy and heraldry. And that, he, that clicked for him. That clicked for him. So with Sheen is, because there's been conscious Moors who have made the claim. I love this match. Man, we, Shim. Shim, you the man, brother. You the man, Shim. Um, there's been conscious Moors that made the claim that we that we gave them. No, 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 no. Sheen's right. No, no, no. There, you gotta who to understand. You can't. You can't. They they are subjects at the end of the day when it because once that treaty peace, what maintains the peace with them, between them is the treaty. Now, when we, we covered lost more sovereignty, what's their position now? Some, it goes back to before the war. The position goes back to where they were before the war. I mean, all right. Return to the original condition. <laughs> I mean, subjects. So you making you, you all right? They're making claims. New Jersey State makes claims on the New Jersey State New Jersey Colony Charter. All right, I'm going to come back to this because this this go there's another question that will that will bring us that will bring us back to Sheehan. All right, continue, Amanda, because I don't want to give up the goods. Okay. Too soon. What, what is a landmark case in the United States Supreme Court that states that pre-revolutionary war rights granted to British subjects before the war? are protected in the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States. I wish the, what's the answer y'all? Cause I gave that earlier. People versus Godfrey. We read, read the question again. Oh, well, that's New York Supreme or New York Supreme Court. Yeah, New what York is Supreme. a landmark case in the United States Supreme Court yeah. that states that pre-revolutionary war rights granted yeah. to British subjects before the war are protected in the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United you, you States. Know, you know the answer. Yeah. Society versus New Haven. Yes, yeah, Society versus New Haven. A, a, a man is right. People versus Godfrey is a New York State Supreme Court case. It's not a United States Supreme Court case. It's a two hundred four year old case. This doesn't need to go to the United States Supreme Court. This remember they made the ruling based. They made a proper ruling based off the seventeen eighty three Treaty of Paris. All right, next one. Number eight. Why don't the original thirteen states operate under the Articles of Confederacy? All right. In seventeen by seventeen eighty. All of the states had enacted the Confiscation Act. Then, and some had enacted the Trespass Act. This is during the war now, the 1780s. So it's still during the Revolutionary War with Great Britain. There are Tories, we have what's called Tories and Loyalists. Tories, Tories is a political party in Great Britain, and Loyalists are those who, and they were, and they were called Tories and or loyalists. And they're called loyalists because they remain loyal to Great Britain. They didn't, you know, they remain loyal, they didn't fight. And so they're, they, these were wealthy loyalists, or Tories and, and or Tories who had 2,000 acres, 500 acres, 
of our, you know, of our land. And um, so the, the 17 by 17, 1779, 1780, the states were confiscating their, their property. Alexander Hamilton was a, was a young a, a lawyer. Uh, he was like 22, 23 years old. And he represented 60 loyalist cases and the state courts. And he, of course, he, you know, he won quite a few cases. And this, um, this act, the Trespassing Act and the state's Trespassing Act and the state's Confiscation Act remained on the books even after the signing and ratification of that 1783 peace treaty. So they were still, so now you're looking at a violation of the treaty. Then the states were not paying their war debts because the states, the, the United States and Congress assembled would, you know, request from the states, you know, monies to pay the war debts. They were slow to foot, you know, some didn't pay. And so this is it's very difficult operating under the Article of Confederation because these are two major issues of treaty compliance and international law compliance and being able to pay war debts. These are two major issues, major, major issues. Something has to be done. So there comes so that so the Articles of Confederation, the way it's structured, doesn't doesn't lend for the compliance of treaties and international law, and also the the a collection of debt collection and finance from the states to pay off war debt. So they needed a stronger instrument. They needed so there was a heavy emphasis on the laws of nation, hence the use of Vital, Locke, Kant. Vital was heavily referenced in the Law of Nations book by Emir de Vital, B-A-T-T-E-L, in the Federalist Papers. So, so we, they look to their principles in political science called Federalism. And the, the heavy study and focus on laws of nation, which is our, which are the principles of the laws of nations are heavily embodied in the United States Constitution. And that John Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, also Thomas Jefferson was included in that, but John Jay, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison were are, are the authors of their Federalist Papers. So, that, so that's the reason. And Article Six of that Constitution, there's no you don't and you you don't enforce treaties through at Article Six. They're already binding. Article Six are for the states. Article Six was part of the solving of the issue. And how's Housenstein versus Lynham? Whereby that is that Article Six, there there is a lengthy write up on Article Six and how the states and the, the the importance of Article Six and how the states are are bound to that. And so Article Six was for the states. That was part of you know having having an instrument that whereby they can hold the state's feet to the fire in compliance to, to treaties. All right, next, next one. So in other words, <clears throat> Abdullah, so, 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 the, um, so under the Articles of Confederation, by them violating, um, they had to put a system in place. So they had to put it, you know, put themselves in check. Yes. Right? And yeah. so therefore, um, that's when I want to show this here uh, real quick. Um, in the Constitution, in the preamble, uh, 
Let me also want to place the spotlight real quick. Um, it has here, we the people of the United States, right here. It says, we the people of the United States, right? It says, in order to form a more perfect union. Yeah, that's that's it. The, that's the more perfect union. The more perfect union is that is the, the principles that's mm -hmm. in that constitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it says, it doesn't say union. It, it doesn't say perfect union, more perfect union. Exactly. It doesn't say form a union, form a, because they already had a union. Mm -hmm. The unions formed on the Articles of Confederation. Remember, they, they, they met. The Articles of Confederation was enforced during the entire drafting and ratification. They did not dissolve the Articles of Confederation and then went to drafting. They, in fact, the the um the Northwest Territory during the drafting of the got uh, during the drafting of, of the United States Constitution at the United States Constitutional Convention, United States during that time period in seven in in July 1787, United States Congress assembled ratified the, 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 the treaty between Great between United States and Morocco. The United States ratified that in July 1787. In July 1787, the United States and Congress assembled, divided the Northwest Territory into five states, five territories, and eventually became states. You know, uh, uh, Michigan, Ohio, Minnesota, Indiana, and um, Oh, uh, it's another one, the, the fifth one, the, the, the five great lakes, the five great lakes in the five states. So that was done. So they were still operating. They were still operating because they're still bound to the treaty. They still have to pay war debts. They're still operating. So, you know, but they're they're working on, you know, solving the issue. They're working on being able to 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 put uh, to uh, draft an instrument whereby they can pay their war debts, be able to collect finance money from the states to be able to pay the war debts, where it's not such a struggle, you know, to try to get money from the states to pay the war debt. And then you know, the instrument where it has a, a more teeth where they can be in compliance with international law and treaty, treaty compliance. Mm -hmm. So continue. You're building up to something, building. This is next question. Okay, number nine. Does the United States have the authority to dissolve the 1783 definitive peace treaty? Absolutely not. That's a, 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 a it's a contract between two parties. Because you have the United States biz, remember they're a league of confederated states because they signed as a league of confederated independent free sovereign states. So that's so just like the NFL. NFL is a league of in the 32 independent companies. 32 independent companies. So so no, absolutely not. That is, that is the, the peace treaty ended the war and it maintains the peace and allows the, the peace treaty, that, that, that peace treaty allows the 13 states, 13 original states, which are the several states that, that's embodied in that constitution. So that's why I'm saying, so now let's, now let's jump to the Constitution now. Several states. Where do we fit in? Where more is fit in? Several states. Several states. Where more is fit in? Where for, several states. Where more is fit in? We're not part and parcel to those, to those um, 
That's why I didn't want to jump. That's why we got it. That's why the preamble is what we have to analyze. Several states. The several states are United States Viz. United States Viz 13. All right. California is not the step part. California doesn't fit into that. Several states. Uh, 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 um, Michigan doesn't fit into that several states. Uh, uh, um, Ohio. Um, Ohio. Uh, Texas state. Not, they don't fit into that several states. That's the 13. That's the 13. That is the parent. They, remember, they formed as a league of sovereign independent states they signed the treaty. They were allowed, they're, they're granted. So the several states are those 13, those, that's the parent, the 13. The 13 original states have more power than the 37 combined. The 37, the other the 37 combined don't, power does not equal up to the, third, the several states. So what they did was, and using the term several states, remember they, so they can remember that they're drafting this. Remember, it's the, they're, they're, they're delegates. The delegates of, that's representing the, their respective states there. So they got, they, they drafted the, the term several states in there. You know, so because that remember they're they're revising the Articles of Confederation, so they're maintaining their you know that they want to have something in there, you know that you know where and they because they because because they also drafted where they can what bring in other states, but they want to lock their position in, you know they they're the parent, so that the. 37 that any other states that come in doesn't override, doesn't gain more power than them. All right, continue. Number 10, why did the United States issue a commemorative stamp in 1983 commemorating ratification of the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States? Acknowledging the that acknowledging the the vital importance of that 1783 definitive peace treaty. Once again, that treaty allows the 13 original states to operate in the bound in the territory boundaries outlined in the 13 colony charters. They claim rights under those charters. Without that treaty, they don't can't can't claim rights under the charter. Yeah, number the next one. Because these questions are structured to educate as well, you know. So I I I have it, you know. Um, that was I was conscious of this. This is part of the the, the questions are part of the education and my answering them. Number 11, why are there no annual ceremonies or national holidays celebrating the ratification of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States? All right, and the, notice in, in the schools, uh, in the history textbooks, there, there, in every history textbook, United States history, they have, they, you know, there's a, a page or, half a page on the, or, or a couple sentences on the, the Treaty of Paris, you know, that ended the war. That, and other than that, doesn't, doesn't say much other than that, the, that, the, that the, you know, the Revolutionary War, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, ended the Revolutionary War. And that's pretty much, you know, was said. Not it's not as important. There's no cases that's that's listed there. They don't do what I'm doing here, explaining this. It's 
it's vital importance that the states are claiming rights. The 13 states are claiming rights under the charter. They, none of that's mentioned. So this, this prevailing idea that Great Britain is no more, you know, that the Revolutionary War extinguished all pre-Revolutionary War contracts. That's not the case at all, but they want they want to keep that out there. They don't want people to, they don't want the general public to know the position of this treaty. In fact, since six, since the 19, since 1960, 60 percent of the of the Supreme United States Supreme Court clerks have come from schools chartered under the crown, what they call Ivy League schools. 60 percent of the United States Supreme Court clerks have come from law schools chartered under, under the crown. Those law schools were chartered. Those schools, Harvard, Dorfmar, um, Brown, Princeton, even Rutgers University, but then that became, you know, through a act of you know, that of the New York Assembly became a state university, but that was chartered on the crown of 1766, New York. I mean Rutgers. They were chartered on the crown. Why is that the case? Why 60% since 1960, 60% 60 of the Supreme Court clerks come from law schools, come from um, taught in the crown, what they call Ivy League schools. Amanda made a, Amanda asked me, this is what, last week, two, maybe two weeks ago. Amanda, no, I know, I think, uh, no, Amanda made a statement and she said, um, she was talking on the phone, and she says that, oh, was it a question? Or why the United States, like why doesn't the United States just, why doesn't the United States just violate the treaty? Like why do they just say, forget Great Britain? Like why don't they just say, great, 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 forget Britain, let's do, do what they want to do? And I said, that's, um, I said, well, that hasn't happened. I mean, look at look at Great Britain's position. Great Britain's position of power. You know, Great Great Britain's position of power even in the world today. And, and so you you know, so we're looking at these these various cases, even People versus Philip. That's seventeen. That's 1973. That's 1973, right there. They're, they're claiming rights under the charter. So that treaty holds a lot of weight. And this is one of the reasons why you have Supreme Court judges coming from those, from Harvard. Uh, of course, you got from Stanford and Yale, but you know, Harvard. Um, you know, it's still heavy with the Supreme Court justices, but also, like I said, the United States Supreme Court clerks. And so they want to make sure that that treaty is upheld. That's a ma that's major for them. That's major. And this is why Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison wrote the Fellers Papers and heavily embodied by Tao in the Fellers Papers and Kant and Locke and, and have principles of laws and nations embodied throughout that United States Constitution. Absolutely. It's structured to be in compliance with treaties and the laws of nations, the way it's drafted. 
And Vital was heavily used. Vital was heavily referenced. All right, next one. Number 12, do the originals, do the 13 original states who derive their original foundational authority to operate in the territorial boundaries outlined in the 13 English British charters and relinquished to them by the English British crown through article one of the 1783 definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States have the authority to restore Moorish land rights to the Moors. All right, Sheen, you up. It's a sheen. That's why I want to say in this day. So this is as a sheen was given. I, it was given up the goods, so I didn't want to go too. So this is um. Let's go back to sheen. Let's go back to sheen. All right, because this is in line with what sheen brought up, right? And um, I want to thank Yannick because Yannick wanted me to have structured this type this question. And you know, this was the, the last question. That I that um, before I uh, he we hung up on that Sunday, and uh, he wanted to have this type of question related to the Moors, and uh, so I, I I was able to to structure this question based on that comments that conversation had with Yannick. Now, this is very important, and. I recall Shim saying many times in 2019 and 2020, one of the classes, you know, that, um, you know, the England and France and the Netherlands are occupying sovereigns. And the United States is not an occupying sovereign. So that's, Can the United States sit down with us and discuss the returning of our land to us? No. No, the United States does not have that authority to sit down with us. This is important. This is very, this is probably the most important question of the 27. Let's go to this treaty of 1783 between Great Britain and the United States. New Jersey claiming rights under New Jersey Colony Charter by virtue of Article One. You're looking at William Penn Charter coming from the Crown. So so the uh, United States is going to sit down with us, all right? Forget Great Britain, don't, I mean, they're going to sit down with us and say, X you, forget you Great Britain, like, you know, forget you Great Britain, you know, we're going to sit down with the Moors. We, we know we got, we got it from you, and we know we got this peace treaty with you, but F you Great Britain, we're going to sit down with the Moors. You can't. That means we got to go to Great Britain. This is very important to understand jurisdiction, to understand the state of our land. You have these set, you have these session treaties with Spain and France. The Louisiana Purchase Treaty is with France. Those. French citizens, the French subjects became citizens of the United States by virtue of the Article 3 of the Louisiana Purchase Treaty. They have, you have, they even claiming rights, land grants that were grant, granted to by the French king. Then you have Spain, remember, ceded to, France ceded it to Spain do the Treaty of Fapalu in 1762. You gotta look at these occupying sovereigns, the Intercaterra Divina, Pope Alexander VI, 1493, authorizing Spain, you know, to colonize. You got these things, these instruments are still in place. So you have to look at the chain of command. And we just, 
United States, 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 United States. Forget Kingdom of Spain, forget Spain and Portugal and the Netherlands, Great Britain, United States, United States, United States. We got to rise in knowledge. We have to rise in knowledge. I urge you to, to look at the, um, the recovery of lost sovereignty, part one and three, two and three that I did. Are, are, they, are, are they on the Moroccan Post Media YouTube page or, or they just don't come TV? Are they also on Moroccan Post Terrence? Yeah, yeah, I, I had to unmute myself. Um, I don't think that they're on the house, but I can grab them. Oh, you can put them in the chat, somebody, uh, um, Crump TV, uh, you just, um, just type, go to Crump TV and type in um, the, uh, the recovery of loss, uh, more sovereignty, parts one, two, and three. I encourage you to watch them because, you know, we have the, the wars and the, we have the land boundary session treaties, you know, between France and Great Britain and Great Britain, France, and Spain, and France. You know the name of the treaty. So this is. Um, I encourage you to watch that. Watch all three. So no, Great Britain, um, United States cannot sit down with the Moors. Is that these conscious Moors have to rise in knowledge? Is that they've been given a very, very, very limited education by conscious movements. Go ahead, King. I got a question. Mm -hmm. So this was pertaining to what I asked before. Mm -hmm. So Mommy. since we can go Mommy. to, since we're we knowing that these no. Spain, no. Great Britain, and mm -hmm. France, could we contact those embassies? No. In relationship. Well, we talk, yeah, we talked about this. You asked you asked that question uh, about a month ago, King. Oh, right. And so I, I'm I'm not... let me let me you we, we talked about government structure though. Yes, we can. This is why it's this is why government structure is so important. Yes, we can. Absolutely. Through government structure. Absolutely. That's how I was just giving because I think well, of some those who haven't watched the show. That, that's why. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, because yeah, they they thinking to do it as individuals. Because because uh, remember, keep in mind the individual. They conscious Moors are being guided into that by conscious Moors. I mean, conscious Moors who've been pushing this individual process. No individual, no not understanding the not being not being taught diplomacy. Not being taught international, we have to uh, we have to study international law. We have to look to international law. We are analyzing by United States statutes, United States Supreme Court decisions based on United States United States Constitutional Convention provisions. You know, not United States, not even treaty cases. We. I was I was there, y'all. I was there for twenty whew, five years of my life. Whew, man, I was there. And I really thought I knew some stuff, man. I really did. And Shir Malachi Bay <laughs> showed me that I didn't know much. It, it, it almost like, damn, what did I know? I mean, of course I knew etymology, and of course I knew grammar, and of course I knew vocabulary building and dictionary study skills, but did I have the knowledge? To look it up? I mean, of course I knew, you know, I written the Masonic Conference of Square and the Connection and Management, Timekeeping. In the Illuminati, Illumination of Mind book. And of course, you know, I've written the Venus book. And I guess I did all the, the astronomy and I could break all that stuff down and etymology and all that. And do, do all, 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 all that. Yes, I could do all that. But did I have the knowledge to liberate our people? No, I did not. I did not. 
I mean, I've, I've learned so much, man, over the past four years, man. I mean, wow. Y'all gonna see in the part two, man. Shemalakai Bay, man. Give it up to him. Give it to Shemalakai Bay, y'all. Question. So, well, uh, in the beginning of Moors and Masonry, because we can see. Um, <laughs> I know he's going. <laughs> he always does it to me. But okay, brother. <laughs> yes. So, so we can see the development of <laughs> Abdullah Bay then and now. And so when you go to the to the uh, beginning of Moors and Masonry, the first book, of course, um, it was that mindset um, that's, you know, that's that's been, you know, plaguing the Moors that the United States, that, that, that the United States is the Moors government and, you know, pretty much that they took over and everything. So that you can see that mindset in the beginning of that book. So will Moors and Masonry be revised? Yes, next year, only because I want to finish, I want to do the study books, you know, the, uh, these courses, you know, the uh, Moorish, Moorish, Moorish Treaty Protection and Council Relations 101 and 201, they're going to be study books. The um, uh, uh, Ritter, Ritter Call Wanto will be one book. Central Authority will be one book. Uh, uh, Council of Notification will be one book. Treaty enforcement be one book, you know. So it'll be, and then we'll have the Moore's body, Moore's body politic formation course book. So I will have about so over the next six months, I would have about six or seven um, study manuals relating to these courses. But once I we get one done, I'm gonna get it out. All right, another one done, we're gonna get it out, and the books will be sold for thirty. Uh, and the man is going to help out in the process of re-looking at, listening to their recorded classes and, you know, doing that. So we, we talked about that. Uh, I'm going to put out the Definitive Peace Treaty book. There's these questions. These questions will go in that book. The Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and United States, 1783, uh, as the ruling authority for the United States. That is coming out in the fall. Next year, I'm going to put out the revised version with a new cover. Yes, I'll put out revised version and talk about. Um, I have a. I'll have a uh, an introduction. Talk about the misconceptions in part one and my mm -hmm. growth and development. Yes. Yes. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. In fact, see. I'm going to structure. I'm going to structure the revised, the revision, as. Chapter one of Moors and Part Two is structured as Chapter one of Moors and Masonry Part Two is structured. That's how Moors and Masonry revised will be structured. Moors and Chapter one of Moors and Part Two. I have points of analysis. Point ten points of analysis. Points of analysis one. Points of analysis two. That I have information on each one, right? And I think six, three or three of say refer to Part One. That's how. I came up with that, so, so question, Abdullah, why isn't it structured that way in the first? Because I didn't come up with that until a year after. I came up with that idea in December 2017, a year after Moors and Race Street Part One was released. What I was doing is I was, you know, I was teaching it at the class in New York, DC, DC and New York and Philadelphia. I was, you know, when the book came out. And so I was like, I was just, it's a, it's a lot of information. I said, well. Wow. Just, I said, oh, I can come up with, I'll do it. I came up with the idea of points of analysis to make it easier to digest it. So that's how part one will be laid out. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go, you have it. All right. Uh, we'll go to the next one. I still want to get to, we, we're, we're going to joke because I want to get to that that section, Terrence, that last 15 minutes. So nine, nine, um, 40, we're going to jump to that section that okay. I sent you today. Okay. All right, continue. Number 13. Mm -hmm. The 13 English British colonies chartered under the sovereignty of the English British crown become the 13 original states. Uh, uh, no. Once again, the freemen and esquires in the colonies 
convened and drafted and, and held and held constitutional conventions and drafted constitutions, 1770, 1776, and 1777, drafted and ratified and, and held and signed and had ratification conventions, forming a separate independent entity from the colonies. When you talk, when you're looking at the colony, let's first go to the contract. The charter, you have the you have the proprietary charters, which are granted to proprietors. You know, William Penn, one proprietor. You had New Jersey, 24 proprietors. You had Georgia, Berkeley, one proprietor. You know, South Carolina was a proprietary colony. You have royal colonies. You have company colonies, Virginia. They, they operate on charters. So you had the land, the, the how it's operated and function and the boundaries of operation, the, the land boundaries are at all in the charter. That's a contract. So that's so the states are operating claims under the charter. So you say that the 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 colonies became the charters. Hmm. So the Lord proprietors, the Lord proprietors, they say the colonies became the charters. I got you. The Lord proprietors, the, the um, royal governors, the royal governors, the governors of the royal colonies, the proprietors of the proprietary colonies, and the companies. So what they did was, all right, so the, the stockholders of Virginia Company came together. So the stockholders, you said the colonies became, the follow me, y'all. So William Penn, so William Penn, you said the colonies became the charters. Well, William Penn, William Penn Penn doesn't have that authority to change that. So William Penn could not, all right, William Penn could not go outside of that colony, that, that contract, and form another. His, uh, the, 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 his authority to operate is in that charter and was granted to him as a proprietor. So William Penn formed, William Penn formed the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? You say that that's, all right, what's, what's going on? What's going on? What's that, when they say the colonies became the states. This is what they mean. When they say the colonies became the states, don't say it's not, that's improper to say it that way. What is proper is that the states are claiming rights under the, the, the charters by virtue of Article One. The states are claiming rights not the counties became the states. The states are claiming rights under the charter charters by virtue of Article One of the Peace Treaty. <laughs> the colonies did not become the states because the the charter they're claiming rights under the charters. They didn't dissolve. All right, they didn't dissolve. New Jersey colony charter. That's not dissolved. People, Martin versus Waddle, Martin versus Waddle, and Martin versus Waddle, it restates New Jersey claiming rights under New Jersey charter, colony charter. All right. You dissolve the charter, then the charter is dissolved then they can't claim rights under it. 
because in the charters are what the boundaries. It's just understanding contract, y'all. That's what they mean to say. They said they just they saying it wrong. They're saying it wrong. What they the proper way to say it is that the states are claiming rights under the charters. That's the proper way to say it by virtue of Article One. That's 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 the that's the, that's the price. That's the that is the proper way to say it. It is improper to say that the states, the colonies became the states. That is absolutely untrue. I know what they mean. I know what they mean. What they mean is that this is what they mean. The states are claiming, that's what they mean. The states are claiming rights and so that's what they mean. So tell them what they mean. I said, oh, yo, oh, the colonies became the states. Oh, what you mean to say is that the states are claiming rights under the charter by virtue of Article One of the Peace Treaty, 1783. All right, so we'll move on. Next one. Number 14. By what authority did the royal governors and the royal colonies, the Lord proprietors and the proprietary colonies, and the companies and the corporate colonies, have to separate from the English British crown and declare independence from the English British crown? None, by no authority. Because their right to even operate is by virtue of the, the charter. They, they have no authority outside of the charter. They have no authority then to that which is granted to them. It's remember the William Penn is granted that his father owed a debt to King King Charles II owed a debt to his father. William Penn was a troublemaker in England. He, they was they put him in jail, and his father went to Charles II and called the debt, you know, to set have his son set up, you know, to set his son up as a proprietor in the colony. So that's a personal right. Outside of that, William Penn ain't got no, per, out, outside of that charter, William Penn has no claim. Virginia, they have no claim outside of the, so what, so this, I right, separate, what, what claim do they have? What claim do they have? All right. The claim was made under the chart. Absolutely. Next. Number 15. Did the 13 English British colonies, proprietary colonies, royal colonies, company colonies, chartered under the sovereignty of the English British crown, declare independence from the British crown in 1776? Absolutely not. Once again, it was the 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 thirteen and the you have the freeholders, the freemen, and you had some esquires that convened in constitutional conventions. It wasn't the proprietors, the Lord proprietors didn't do that. You're looking at the Virginia Company; those are still have stockholders. It wasn't the royal governors. Then you're looking at the freehold freemen. You have some subjects that convened in constitutional conventions. They had constitutional conventions. They drafted constitutions. They had ratification conventions, and they formed separate political entity from the colonies, because the colony is a political entity. It's the what formed the colony is the charter. The charter, the charter creates the colony. I what it is, y'all. When people say colony, they just they think they 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 only associated with land. They're not thinking. They're not thinking like Abdullah Bay. They're not thinking contract. They're not thinking contract colony. Land. They're not thinking. I'm not thinking. I'm thinking contract. 
And the contract is the boundary of the land. When you say colony, I, this is where, I, I, I'm telling you, this is where the confusion is. This is where the misconception lies. Rather. The misconception lies is that the general public only associates colony with a body of land and not the contract at all. A jurist doesn't even think like that. Quite naturally, they're not jurists. A jurist doesn't think like that. A jurist is not even trained and think like that. A jurist is trained the contract. They look, oh, body of land. Yeah, the body of land. See, the colonies became the states. See, see, the it was a colony, body of land, colony. Now it's a state. The colonies became the state. They're not looking at contract. That's where the misconception lies. Just ask, just talk to people. I guarantee, I guarantee you. I guarantee you. I guarantee you, the charter ain't coming out their mouth. It's going to be land. Guarantee you. That's where the misconception lies. But in this class, we got we got to pay y'all to be jurists, become jurists. So y'all gonna look at the contract always. Next. Y'all gonna get this. I'm gonna get this. Number 16. Did the English British colonies, proprietary colonies, royal colonies, and company colonies chartered under the sovereignty of the English British crown establish the United States in 1776? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The, once again, the freeholders, some free has some free men and freeholders and subjects and esquires that convened in constitutional conventions in 1776 and 1777 and, and drafted a drafted constitutions and ratified constitutions, thereby forming a separate political entity from state, from the state, from the colony of New Jersey, a separate political entity. So you have two political entities, the colony and the states. To this very day, to this very day, because they're operating, the, 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 the charters have not been dissolved. They're claiming rights under the charter. And that's under the international law term called ute pastidistis juris. Utis pastidistis juris, whereby the, the, the boundaries of the predecessor state is what? Relinquished or ceded to the secession, the successor state. Utis pastidistis juris. So once again, looking at look into international law. So the states are claiming rights under the charter and the boundaries and operating in the boundaries outlined in the charters. All right, next one. Ute, UTI, let me spell it. UTI, Ute, Pasta Distis, P O S S E D E T I S. All right, thank you, Amanda. Juris. <laughs> I see you on this. <laughs> It's in the chat, y'all. Ute pasta distis juris. All right. We have to teach international law. The only way you would understand this and, and contract. Next. Number 17. Did the English Brit British crown relinquish her jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the territorial boundaries to the lands outlined in each of the 13 British colonies charters to each of the individual states in Article I of the 1783 Definitive Peace Treaty between Great Britain and the United States, 
or in the Articles of Confederation of 1781? Article one of the Defending the Peace Treaty, because they it's not relinquished in the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is where they form as a League of Independent Free Sovereign States, and this is why they ha and they'll have uh, United States viz name all thirteen, and they what took that use that same construction in Article One of the Definitive Peace Treaty. But it's the Definitive Peace Treaty, Article One, and People versus Godfrey reference made the claim to Article of the 1783 Peace Treaty. I'm just and I and I and I structured this, you know, to to come back to it to because we I, I learned through years of teaching that you have to you know, be repetitive, come with, structure a question a different way, you know? Different angles. Different angles, I'm coming from a different angle, that's all. It's not, this. it's a different question, but it's a different angle. Absolutely, mm -hmm. thank you, Terrence. Same question, different angle. Yep. Um, do uh, you wanna take questions right now? See, see if anyone yes. has questions. Let's take questions, yes. Anybody type anything in the chat that you might wanna, um, yeah, uh, I didn't. Any questions, y'all? Please, please, questions. Abdullah, have a drink of water. Yeah, I do. I mean, yes, yes. Let me, let me. Yeah, I haven't had time, but let me do that now. Hey, peace, y'all. This is Shin. Um, I just it's a reference to uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You you named three different. Uh, I guess they're the same people. They're the same people, but they had different status. You said the subject, or you no, you didn't say the subject. You said the freemen, the freeholders, and the proprietors. So could you break down? No, I didn't. I didn't mention the proprietors. I did the. Uh, uh, I mentioned um, some freemen. Uh, you have esquires. No, I didn't mention proprietors. Okay. The proprietors are the ones that are. The proprietors are the. Providers are, are granted the charter from the crown, so it it is it is their that's that's their personal right. That colony, William Penn, that's his personal right. That's his his heirs and successors. And the freeholders are the you had, you had some freeholders living on the that's living in that area, living in the colony boundaries. And you had um, some freemen living in the county boundaries, and so subjects, based on the, so based on the fact that <clears throat> excuse me, they're not they're not called subjects. They I mean so they have a, they have a higher ranking though. Yes, oh, have right. That's what I, that, that's what I, I said yeah, status, but I meant the, rank. No, it's still status. No, it's still status. It's still status. It's still status. Also, don't don't I don't want you to not say status. I don't want you not to say status and then say another word, all right? Because that that's, when you're talking rank, you're still talking the status. Mm -hmm. In rank, if you say king, that's still status. If you say noble, that's still status. You're still saying status. So I want you to tie rank and status, connect rank and status. Because the status is, I mean, status, S-T-A is the root word, standing. So what is the status? Well, he's of a he is a king. He's a emperor or em, she's empress, you know, oh. or right. So there's still so rank and status are connected. Okay, so with the so with the free so the freeholders and the, the freemen, as you say, so those those will be like the stockholders. Would those be the or the board members? Well, no, well, no, they they not of all, all right. You have different different. You have uh, what's different, inside what's inside the colony within the colony. No, because the 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 that the if depend it depend if you're talking stockholders, you're talking Virginia. You talk okay. about a company okay. chain. There's no there's no stockholder mm -hmm. in a proprietary colony. The proprietors are the stockholders. The proprietors, you know, 24 in New Jersey, William got one in Pennsylvania, all right? And also Delaware too, remember that was granted to William Penn as well and his, his heirs. 
So, um, yeah, so you have, you know, one. So, but you're talking stockholders, you're talking a company colony, a colony where like Virginia, Virginia is a company, Virginia company, Virginia company was granted a charter to set up a colony, to operate a colony. So that's a company. That's also, that's also a personal right. The company's chartered in Great Britain. The Virginia company was chartered in Great Britain. And they were, they were, and they have stockholders. Just like you have the Massachusetts Bay, Massachusetts Bay Company, Virginia Company. So you have the company charters, proprietary charters, all right? And then the royal charters. Royal charters, that which are under the, the royal charters are not, the royal charters, they're a royal colony, that's not a personal right. So that's not a personal right. So they would be, um, there would not be any claims under that. You know, even to this day, it would be the claims would be made under personal rights. It's just personal rights. So William Penn and his heirs have a personal right, even to this very day. So that 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 treaty did not remove William Penn. The 1783 treaty between Great Britain and the United States did not remove William Penn and his heirs and successors' personal rights. And that goes back to the principle of, of international law dealing with relinquishing session treaties and a relinquishment that meant that is referenced in uh, Philip versus State, 17, uh, 1973, that was read earlier. Islam. Islam. Islam, Islam. Angel Bay. Uh -huh. Grand Rising. Oh, I have a question. So in relationship to the papal bull that was issued by the actor um, Pope um, that was issued to the actor President Barack H. Obama in 14, um, and it stated that, you know, all, everything was to be ceased and void, nunc pro tunc, essentially. And it stated the America major and America minor. And it stated that the minor worked for the major and that um, the major is essentially, well, it is owed, you know, all the debt that um, the minor owes to the major. And, um, the st and it stated that all bonds and everything, you know, was voided, nunk pro tunk, and that um, all policy enforcers and all those, you know, the the all the fictitious actors no longer have any more jurisdiction at this at this land. So um, when I when I hear you speak about, you know the colonies and the charters and such um and how they have rights um regarding to the colony i mean um to the crown the british crown how does that all play out as far as you know i know it's not up for grabs i know there's there's a let me ask you a question let me ask you a question Andrew. i got you i understand let me ask you all right, let's go to the let's go to contract. Okay. Let me go to contract. 198 uh, 1453. 1453, Pope Alexander the mm -hmm. All right, that's the Divina. Authorizing Spain, not Barack Obama, not United States. Mm -hmm. Authorizing Spain. That con that's a that's look at the language in the contract. Let's not go to no Barack Obama. Let's not go to United States. Let's look at the let's go to let's go to these contracts. All right. That's authorizing Spain. So that has to be sent to Spain, not Barack Obama. That has to be sent to Spain. That has to be sent to uh, the uh, the uh, uh, should have been sent to Queen Elizabeth. You know, she was living at the time. Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Spain, uh, Portugal, not 
the United States. United States is not an occupying sovereign. Mm. So you, so I hear people speeding that, people quoting that. That's why this is why I'm doing this. Looking at the contract, looking, looking at the, uh, uh, looking, looking at um, uh, all my um, recovery of lost more sovereignty um, mm -hmm. on Plum TV Part One, Two, and Three. So he went to Barack Obama. Who is Barack Obama? An actor. President of the United States. So what is the United States? Corporate fiction. You got, you got New Jersey State claiming uh, claiming rights on the New Jersey County Charter. Mm -hmm. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania claiming rights. These are subjects. Yes, Islam. He's yeah. going to subjects. You look at you, you're going to subjects. Mm. That's the same. That's why we have to go back to we we we're looking, we conscious mores are viewing United States as an occupying sovereign. Uh-huh. All right, that's all right. That's 1952 case. So I don't I don't want people to say Abdullah. I don't want people to say I'm talking on my butt. I just 1952 case between France and the United States in the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. I see Jay. France won her case, our most favorable nation case, by standing on Moorish treaties. There was three mm -hmm. types of treaties that were used to determine the extent of United States constitutional jurisdiction in Morocco. And the 19 and, and also that's one of the the second type of treaties was the Act of Algiers and the Act to Protect Morocco. And the Act to Protect Morocco, 1906. Mm -hmm. When it comes to European questions, United States has no jurisdiction. You also have, I'm not done, you have the 1648 Peace of, Peace of Westphalia. 1648 Peace of Westphalia. That's the United Nations for the Europeans. United Nations is not the United Nations for the Europe. The United Nations for the Europeans is the Peace of Westphalia. That's the United Nations for the Europeans. The Peace of Westphalia 1648 that ended the that ended the Hundred Year War. Mm. Thirty states that come about the Europeans. All right, where even the, the you have also the 17 1713. 1713 Treaty of Utrecht, 1713, that ended the War of Spanish Secession from 1701 to 1713. These instruments are still in force. The, the definition, the modern definition of state that's used in international law today and how states, are, the modern structure of states today is based in the Treaty of Utrecht, which is a series of three treaties in the Peace of West Philly of 1648, in Chapter 2 of Moors of Basie, Part 2, I have there a yearly conference that I didn't even know this. I came, I came up, I found this three months ago. Yearly conference that's based in analyzing the 1648 Treaty of Peace of West Philly. Mm -hmm. Congress Moors knowledge of is limited. It's limited. Wow. These are this is the international law of of the uh, international law of colonialism of colonization is the 16 1550 um is the intercatera divina of uh, 14 1453 and you also have one before that there was two before that two inter there's three intercatera divinas all together. The first one was 1453. And you also had the treaty and the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas authorized, signed by Pope Alexander VI between Portugal and Spain that divided, you know, lands of uh, operation. And Spain had mo got most of it. 14, 14, 14, uh, 94, the Treaty of Tordesillas. This is still in operation. Mm. United States is not occupying sovereign. 
Well, I've always understood once I got conscious and woke that they were de facto. Um, and I never, ever identified them as occupying sovereign. No, 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 hold on. Uh, uh, the United States that signed, all right, this whole different United States to de facto, that's whacked. That's whacked, Angel. Okay. The only United States that has authority is the one that signed the definitive peace treaty between yeah. Great Britain and United States. You can, you can throw a hundred United States in my face. Throw a hundred United States in my face. Who gives a rat you know what? Bring it. The one, is that which United States signed this Treaty of Paris? The only United States. Which, what United States signed this Treaty of Paris? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. What United States, don't give me the one in 19, whatever formed in, you know, in Delaware and the Florida. No, no, no. Give me, all right. What, give me the one that signed. See, more, oh. more is knowledge are limited. That, that knowledge is limited. I was there too, Angel. I was there. I was there. No, I do remember um studying with you time ago and that you met i remember there are several corporations that were enacted because of all of the different bankruptcies that took place so the original united states is the one that signed that document thank you that's all that matters because that's yeah. the only one that has a that, that's the only one that has authority to operate yeah all right, let me move on. Um, Terrence. All right, so what do you want to go to? We have another, yeah, go to the next, go to the next document because I want to at least get that on, okay. on the record. Go All to the right. next document. The um the misconception uh paradigm, paradigm two, yes. All right, this is um uh you put that in the chat, Amanda. This is uh this is chapter 10. This is excerpt of chapter 10 of Moors and Masonry part two. The title of chapter 10 of Moore's Macy part two is the is the the um the title of these classes, the series of the classes, Moore, Moorish Treaty Protection and Constellations. Moorish Treaty Protection and Constellation is the title of chapter 10 of Moore's Macy part two. And I'm giving you an excerpt. What I did, I did this in class. I did this class at the Academy of Providence in one of the classes. I three, the three three paradigms that exist among our people. There are three paradigms that exist among our people. You have paradigm that exists among Moors classified as Negro colored black. You know, thinking that the 13th Amendment, you know, free us and the you know, 14th Amendment, citizens of clause, 15th Amendment, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, that's, that paradigm exists among Moors classified as Negro colored black. We have a paradigm, paradigm two, you know, you know, which we're going to deal with today. Uh, Moors being taught, as I was for 25 years. This is paradigm two was Abdullah Bey for 25 years, being taught to use the United States Constitution for my protection. That was I was taught that for 25 years. I was in that mindset. I taught that to thousands of people. That's paradigm two. Paradigm three is where we are right now. This is paradigm three, what you've been taught, what I've been taught for four, four years, what I've been teaching for four years, paradigm three. We do, you know, recovery of lost more sovereignty, reversion to sovereignty, re-enter the international community, you know, and the, as, a old, as an old and original state, you know, um, treating more as treaty protection, using more as treaties, that's paradigm three. We're gonna deal with paradigm two today of Moors, um, conscious Moors being taught to use United States Constitution for the protection in place of more streets. All right, go ahead, hit it, Terrence. Um, Amanda? Paradigm two. Did we put that in the chat for everybody? Yeah, I put it in there. All right, if that's in the chat, y'all, what she's reading is in the chat. Excerpt from Moors and Masonry Part Two, Chapter 10, Moors Treaty Protection and Consular Relations by Abdullah El Talib Mozi Bey. Paradigm two. Miscon misconceptions taught to conscious Moors. Conscious Moors have been taught to use the United States Constitution in place of Moorish treaties for their protection. 
Moors are part and par partial or parcel of the United States and must live the life accordingly. Point two, Moors are, quote, we the people of the United States in the preamble to the United States Constitution. Point three, 35 Moors were at the United States Constitutional Convention from March 1787 to September 1787. Point four, Moors inalienable rights are secured under the United States Constitution. Point five, Moore's right to travel is secured under the United States Constitution. Point six, Moore's should use a judicial notice outlining the various United States Supreme Court decisions showing how the United States Constitution protects the United States citizens inalienable right to travel. Point seven, Moore's have a right to invoke the First Amendment to the United States Constitution to protect their inalienable right to the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of assemble peace, peaceably, and the freedom to petition the United States government for redress of grievances. Point eight, Moore's have a right to invoke the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution to protect their inalienable right to bear arms. Point nine, Moors have a right to invoke the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution for their protection against unreasonable search and seizure for their houses, papers, and effects, and the right to invoke to demand from European colonial states official and officers a Fourth Amendment warrant and probable cause. Point 10, Moors have a right to invoke the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution to protect their right against being forced to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless a presentment of indictment of a grand jury. Point 11, Moors have a right to invoke the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution to protect their inalienable right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed and thought-provoking questions concerning Moore's treaties for conscious Moors who have been taught to use the United States Constitution in place of Moore's treaties for their protection. Question one, what does it mean in the laws of nations when the Moors who are of a foreign government with treaties with the United States of America renounce their allegiance to the government of Morocco and pledge allegiance and seek protection to the United States? Question two, what does it mean in the law of nations for a nation of people to rely on the constitution of a foreign power and or government for their protection? Question three, can the following be implemented by using the United States Constitution and United States laws? The recovery of lost Moorish sovereignty, the enforcement of reversion to sovereignty, or the international law of principle of returning a people held in slavery to their original condition before slavery known as post -luminium. Restore a national central Moorish government, write a national Moorish constitution that will unite the Moors under Moorish national sovereignty, Enforce pre-existing bilateral Moorish treaties with France, the Netherlands, Great Britain, Denmark, Spain, the United States, Sardinia, Austria, Belgium, and Germany, which cover the period from 1631 to 1892. Negotiate treaties with, the, uh, with other sovereign nation states. Establish Moorish embassies and consulates in foreign countries. Send Moorish ambassadors, consul generals, consuls, and consul agents to other sovereign nation states, receive ambassadors, consul generals, consuls, and consul agents from other na sovereign nation states, trade with other nation states, legislate the laws of a Moorish nationality and Moorish citizenship, legislate Moorish immigration and naturalization laws, legislate the laws of a Moorish passport, use the Moorish passport, to travel outside the country and not having to be subject to a United States passport, legislate Moorish ministries and departments. All right. So that's uh, chapter two of Moorish Part Two.
the, the Moorish Treaty Protection and Consular Relations. This is, um, this is just thought provoking, you know, and um, that misconception that we are part and parcel, that we are founders and 35 Moors and we are we the people, that misconception locks us in. It's, it stunts our growth. It stunts the growth of this movement. I mean, 25 years of observation. I mean, actually 30 years almost, but 25 years I was locked into that paradigm for 25 years. It stunted my growth. I was locked into that. I mean, I done, did the research, I did the treaty studies, I did the tree, I did Moors and Masonry research, the consolidated treaty series in 1998, the, the letters, over 100 letters from the National Archives in Philadelphia in 1997, and historical Pittsburgh societies, and studying astronomy, etymology, vocabulary, semantics, grammar. I knew all that, but I did not have enough to liberate our people. I did not, because I was locked into the misconceptions. Even having read written more than Mason history, because I, because I, I wrote looked at the the treaties from a historical perspective, and Shem opened me up into in looking at the treaties from a law perspective and how they can be used, be enforced even to this day. I was just using them as instruments of history to show our power during particular times. You know, so I've grown over the past four years and I've resulted that I can help, I can, I, can help facilitate along with help from y'all, with Terrence and Shim, consciousness to hundreds of thousands of our people. Hundreds of thousands of our people we can reach. I mean, we, that could have been done. I mean, you're talking about 25 years. I mean, we dealt with thousands. We dealt with tens of, I mean, tens of thousands. I mean, shucks, I mean, jeez. Just imagine this was out there 25, 20 years ago. So it's not as if we didn't connect with people, but you've got misconceptions. You're not building structure. I mean, if people calling me, give me one minute, King. I've gotten, I received about over a hundred calls in a 10 year period. People from all over. More Abdullah, I got a nationality card, but my job won't take it. Abdullah, I got a nationality card, but my job won't take it. Abdullah, got this Moore's doc paperwork, but my job won't take it. Abdullah, got this Moore's paperwork, but my job won't take it. Call at time after time. It's like no political structure, no diplomatic relations, no. Man, you got these, you got Moors, five Moors, 10 Moors claiming to have a national government, the Moorish national federal government, the Moorish national this 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 government. 30 years of that. It's a joke. Reform bill. Step inspection. Lauren Hardy. The three stooges, Albert and Costello, a joke. Thirty years of observation. That's the Shir Malachi Bay. Shir Malachi Bay, y'all. I don't idolize anybody. I don't worship anybody. But I give respect 
and honor and appreciation will do. So it's not idle because I don't idle anyone. I don't worship anyone. But I give honor, respect, and appreciation. All right, King. Uh, that was that was by accident, but I mm -hmm. just want to applaud you, you guys, you and Sam, for the for the information. Terrence too. Terrence too. I mean, Terrence. you guys, you guys have done a tremendous job with education, and this should be the new education format. For the Moors community, so that we can develop. Oh, it is, brother. It ain't should be. It ain't well, should it be. Is. It is, bro. It ain't. We gonna change that should be. That subjunctive mood. We gonna change it to indicative mood. We gonna change it to indicative mood. It is. We gonna we drop the subjunctive mood and use the indicative mood. It is. So I just I want to thank y'all for everything y'all been doing. I. I it just, it's a refreshing, a breath of air, cause even some of the stuff that I use, I use treaties as contracts. Those are enforcements. Yeah. So I just wanted to, just to tell you, give you your flowers now. I appreciate y'all, thank y'all, you know, and let's keep this going and push it. Oh, we will, yeah, we will. Yeah, we've um, connected with um, Makakavu, Makakavu, I keep, I, uh, <laughs> Ali Ilbe, he's on the flyer. Um, Shima Terrence will show the flyer again. He's on the bottom right of the flyer. He'll be joining me. I'll be joining him in Jonesboro, Georgia. Um, not this Sunday, the following Sunday. And um, he's, um, we, he's, um, we, working um, to get together a more summit in June. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. But um, this brother is well connected. And um, I did connect to him with, um, he, he talked to Shim yesterday. He talked to Terrence about two or three days ago. He talked to Yannick uh, about over a week ago. And so I connected him. We're gonna bring him on um, the Moroccan Post Media on a, on a Sunday. We'll, we'll probably in about a month or so. So he's well connected. And uh, there is also an Ataka convention in Georgia in September. Uh, Ataka Alliance, and he'll have um, uh, various um, of our brothers and sisters from the from the continent here. And he's looking to um, he wants to have the more summit in June so that we can um, have some uh, we can work to to um, bring different Moorish body politics together so that we can meet with with the the uh, meet with the um a a, a um contingent body of um of um of brothers and sisters on the continent and and at the Attica convention in uh, Georgia in September. So he has a lot of connections to fifth organizations. Yeah so we we definitely won't roll with this. And Yannick with um, pushing forward, and you have our serious here. You have Yannick, who's um, leading the way in the Moorish, the Moorish Southeast Region uh, Civic Association. You have uh, our serious in the uh, North, the uh, Southwest Region. You know, so we're definitely moving forward, brother. My mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, thank you. So we got, uh, we're going to close out. Moroccan Post School of Government and International Law. All right, we got the Moroccan Post Media, Moroccan Post Media YouTube page. All right, click subscribe. We go to the YouTube page. Subscribe, y'all. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. While right, this will be this week, we upload it to the Moroccan Post Media YouTube page. All as all our classes are. All right, we'll be on Moroccan Post. This will be. I will be doing this again on Sunday. I will be doing this again. The 27 questions on Sunday, y'all, will be aired on, you know, larger platforms. All right. So this will be done on, on Sunday. Same topic on Sunday. All right. That's Sunday from 6 to 8. 
uh, Eastern Standard Time. All right, that's the um, uh, Mark and Post Media YouTube page as well as uh, Crumb TV aired live on both channels. And that will be um, from Sunday, six to eight, this Sunday from uh, seven, from uh, six to eight Eastern Standard Time, six to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so it'll be the same title, all right? And we dealt just in this 27 questions, all right? Uh, we have my books, The Moors of Mastery, Part One, Masonic Compass Square and the Connection of Timekeeping and Measurement, Illuminati and Illumination of the Mind, How Her Moon, How Her Venus and Moon Rule, Etymology and, and Vocabulary, Etymology and Vocabulary, something that you want coming with your way soon. Moors and Masonry, Part Two, The Power of Moors Treaties and the Recovery of Lost Moors Sovereignty. Next, will we have, all right, coming. This is uh, February 19th. That's how uh, you have on the bottom right, you have Brother Makakuvu Ali Il Bay. I spoke of him earlier. Then we have of the radio station WSTV uh, in Jonesboro, Georgia, Seymour Bay. And uh, so Makakavu Ali Il Bay will be the guest speaker. I am the key, I will be the keynote key speaker. And Ali and Brother Seymour Bay will be performing. And we have another sister that will be performing. She was on the other flyer. All right, so- um, Sponsors. Who's that? The sponsors, Power- uh, Yeah, sponsors, uh, yeah, po yeah, Power uh, STV the Radio, Atlanta. I yes, can't- Power, uh, Power WSTV, Atlanta 104.9. <laughs> you gotta read it, brother. All right. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so um, Prince, you're from, you're there. Um, will you be there? Uh, so we have the, the um, this will not be aired. Um, it's, a, it's just going to be, it won't be aired. So mm -hmm. there's no, um, but they have, they, we have the event right. That's only for people who are going to be there in attendance. Mm -hmm. So it won't be aired on the radio. It's, it's at the radio station, but it won't be aired on the radio. Mm -hmm. The radio station has uh, a section that seats 300 people. That's why, yeah. Because they, the way they, they, they stay structured that way, so they can actually have lectures and you know program, you know programs at the station. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the logo: the Moroccan Post School of Government International Law, designed by Terence. <laughs> Terence Bay designed this. You know, he well, he put yeah, he actually put the logo. Yeah, this is um, he's gonna do the write up for it. I love yeah. it, Terrence. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks. It's actually it's much like the um the uh, Moroccan Post um yes uh, logo, the same uh same exact elements. Um, so yes, um, yeah, just, just Islam, wait. brother Terrence, it looks good. This is Angel Bay. Yeah, oh, it's long time. It's a shit. Hey, we need to get them sweatshirts and them, them t shirts popping off. Yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we gotta do that, T. We gotta get some Real shirts. spill. Right. Hey, we gotta get some shirts because I'll definitely rock. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm gonna need like four. I'm having every color. Yeah. <laughs> Real yeah. And, and, and it, it'll ask, and, it, and what it does is open it indirectly opens up people to. Hey, to be curious, to be uh, to ask about what what that is, mm -hmm. you no. know, what does that what does that symbolize? What what uh, where is that school at? So yeah, push the school too. Yep, yeah. sure good. Yes, um, every everything in this um, in this seal here has a uh, has a story behind it. Um, in fact, it's 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 heavily. Uh, oh well, I wouldn't say borrowed. Uh, <laughs> But it's it's um, the concept comes from the Haudenosaunee uh, Constitution, um, also known as the Iroquois Constitution. So where they would have the um, the eagle at the top of the tree, um, the eagle you know has the ability to see far to see afar. So when he when the eagle would see danger coming, then the eagle will then come and notify the people. Well, the concept is is that the, that the people are we're we're already in danger, so that's why he's coming down to. Um, but anyway, I already I already gave you kind of like part of the write up, but but that's pretty much what that represents. So the eagle coming down and, and 
you know, to let us know that we are in danger. So that's what that is. Instead of being at the top of the tree. So, um, but yeah, just wait for the write up and, um, you know, that's, that's part of it. All right, real quick, Abdullah, too. Um, yeah. What the last, uh, it was, uh, it was a class, but it was, uh, where was it? I can't think of where it was at. It was like the last, um, it was like the last event and we could go online or we could actually go. Did you ever get up with that brother to see if the people who uh, paid for the live stream? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I got, I, I'll ask, I'll call them more. I need to talk about the game, um, the end game. The end game. The end game, yes, yeah, yes. Call, call them more. Yeah, the production wasn't to my satisfaction, but yeah, but don't th don't let that stop you from getting a hold of dude and, and getting that intel out there because I yeah like I I need that because that was I did miss a couple parts what you know yeah run that Islam peace I appreciate it <laughs> all right we'll end here um hey, if you like to stay on um then. All right.